Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sex People, brought to you by the fine folks here at the Mystery Box Show. My name is Eric, and I will be your host for this evening. Uh, for those familiar with the Mystery Box Show, uh, we primarily exist as a space where people tell true stories about their lives, all on the subjects of sex and sexuality. Uh, but even broader than that, our main goal is to normalize the conversation around sex and sexuality. You know, it's it's so taboo in our culture to talk about very much regarding sex at all. So conversation is what sex people is all about. And uh, we've invited a panel of experts and sexperts. Is that a word? Um, and, uh, and, and we're going to approach a variety of topics tonight. Um, and in our final section of the evening, we'll even be hearing from you. We've been collecting voicemails from you, calling them in uh, over the course of the past week. And we'll uh, be able to put your questions in front of the entire panel. Um, but for now, just to start off, I want to start with a brief thought about sex positivity and the way that the way that we view it at the Mystery Box show. Um, to us, sex positivity basically it feels like we have a, we all individually have a, a vision of what our ideal sex positive future looks like, everything that we're aiming for. We are sex positive because we want people to behave this way or to treat each other this way. Um, but I think interestingly, I, I don't think any one particular individual's vision of sex positivity completely matches up with the other but I think many of us agree that we are all very, very far away from whatever our ideal versions is. And we're all sort of paddling in the same direction uh, until we get closer and closer and closer. So all of that's to say that everybody you might hear from tonight or everybody who you will hear from tonight will have a different perspective, a different opinion. And that's what the conversation is about. And and really embracing those differences and listening to each other, hearing, maybe being influenced by each other. That's one of my favorite things is to hear perspectives that I hadn't considered before and be like, oh yeah, that adds to where I was coming from. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so let's see, I'm, I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, before bringing our panelists on board, uh, I wanna introduce you to our production assistant extraordinaire, Nicole Perkins. Nicole's going to be uh, keeping an eye on the chat window tonight. So everybody, please say hello to Nicole. Hello, hello. Nicole. Hello, Hi. everyone. <laughs> uh, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks all for being here. Um, I'm the production assistant for the Mystery Box Show, and I will be here moderating the comments, both on, on Facebook and YouTube. Um, I'm here to be your voice for the show. So if you have questions for our panelists, questions about the topics, not even questions, if you just have your own thoughts and feelings about what we're talking about, uh, let us know and I will pass it along. That's awesome. Thank you, Nicole, so much for doing that. Um, we'll hear from you throughout the show. And uh, with that, it is time to meet our panelists this evening. So our first panelist, um, is a good friend of ours. She uh, she has done our show, uh, gosh, Valentine's Day, I wanna say two years ago now, um, but it's been so wonderful to get to know her and, uh, and, and to have her friendship and input. Uh, she is the author of Girl Sex 101 and the just recently released Getting It, A Guide to Hot and Healthy Hookups and Shame-Free Sex. Will you please welcome Allison Moon. Hey, Hi. Allison. Hi, nice to see you, Eric. How are you this evening? I'm great, thanks. How are you? Um, we can't hear you. Are you muted at the moment? I'm not. Oh, I'm no. Not. No, I, there, there is no sound at all. Oh, Lee yeah. can hear me. Oh, I can hear you now. Everybody else could hear her? Hello. Okay. Hello. Um, <laughs> it looked like there was some technical stuff going on. Cool. Okay. Thank you for, uh, for, for waiting through that. <laughs> um, so as, as we're getting to meet all our panelists to sort of uh, just bring us into your lives a little bit, I um, want to ask just a general question, a getting to know you question. Can you, Allison, tell us about the last movie you saw and what you thought <laughs> of it? Yes. Uh, so I, because of the pandemic, been diving deep into our, you know, old movies that we never got around watching. So my partner and I have been trying to like find from the 90s and the aughts that we haven't seen yet. And so we realized but neither of us had seen Constantine, the comic book movie with Keanu Reeves as a basically a 
ghost demon kill. And it was surprisingly fun. Panned when it came out, it got terribly at the box office, but Tilda Swinton is in it and she's awesome and Keanu's great. I loved it. So yeah, big fan. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It's been really interesting to see the Keanu-sance happening. Oh, I know, like, right? <laughs> he was good so blind you know? for so many years. <laughs> That's good. I'm I'm happy to see him in all sorts of places popping up now. So yeah. Right on, right on. Cool. <laughs> well, uh, we're gonna get to the other panelists and then bring you back when we get to the uh, discussion part. So it's so it's nice to meet you and introduce you to everybody. <laughs> um, let's move on to our next panelist. Um, who was a delight when we met him uh, back in 2014. He came to Portland to do our show uh, and tell a story with us. He was fantastic. Um, he's an educator, an instigator, an author of many books, including uh, tra uh, Traversing Gender, Understanding Transgender Realities. Uh, will you please all welcome Lee Harrington. Hey, it's great to be here. Good to see you again. How's it going, Lee? Oh, it's good. It's good. I'm, I'm not uh, hearing anybody. Hmm. Um, but but apparently, I'm the only one with that issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you for uh, for. Um, sorry, I'm getting flustered. I'm running the tech and uh, and 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 hosting the show, which is uh, turning out to be a little bit of a twisty turny um, labyrinth. Um, I should also, yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna press on. I'm gonna press on. So Lee, thank you for bearing with me. Um, getting to know you question, uh, have you been binging any TV lately? Any good shows to tell about? Yeah, I personally don't use the language of binge since I've had people with uh, eating disorders in my life, but I've had some great marathons recently and I'm doing one right now where I'm going back and watching The Magicians, which is a series on Netflix. And because a new season came out, so I'm like, I'm just gonna start over, I have time. And I'm loving the fact that this show doesn't back down from topics like rape. It doesn't you know, pull back from topics um, that are hard, that are challenging about suicide, and that on each show that brings up hard issues like that, puts in uh, support phone, li phone lines that you can call if this has triggered you. And I respect shows so much that do things like that. And on top of that, there's magic and great sex, so how can you go wrong? That's super awesome. I, I remember hearing great things about The Magicians. Um, I also, cool, I'll put it, I'll add it onto our list. Um, I also want to say that I really appreciate you uh, throwing the word marathon out there um, instead of the word binge. That's something that I hadn't even considered and that is terrific. That is definitely a better word marathon uh, to use in, in respect to people who have, uh, who have had who have had th things in their lives. I, I speak very ineloquently about things, but marathon, that should be a word that uh, infuses my vocabulary. I feel like vocabulary is going to be a theme of the evening. Which um, I find so juicy when I learn new words because it's an opportunity for me to consider, do I love what I'm already using? Does it apply to me, right? Or do I want to evolve? And I that notion of freedom for new ideas and the chance for me to evolve, I, I love that. 100%, yeah, and like I said, I, I feel like there's gonna be a bunch of that tonight. We, through the course of running the show, Reba and I have had that uh, kind of education over and over, and it keeps on coming, which is it's terrific. Um, for anybody interested in finding more about Lee or any of his books, uh, you can find them at Passion and Soul. It's written right there on the screen, um, and that's also in the video description. And, uh, and Lee, I'm gonna take you off screen and we'll bring you back for the discussion section. Perfect. All right. And uh, Allison, if it's all right, I am going to um, bring you back for one moment because like I said, as I am running the tech here, uh, trying to juggle many, many things, uh, I should have mentioned here that your books <laughs> included a brand new one, also available at girlsex101.com. So if anybody would like to, uh, to check out Allison's books. Uh, and Allison, when when did Getting It get released? It was like weeks ago, right? It just came out, yeah, it came out on December 29th. So just about a month ago, maybe? 
Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah it's it's right behind it. It'll be behind uh, Allison for the entire show. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for letting me bring you back for that. Uh, let's move on to uh, our next panelist, who is a dear friend of ours, who's, who's told two stories at our show and been a guest at our dinner parties. Um, we love her so much. And we love, anytime there's a conversation happening, uh, Camille will always have something unique to contribute. And just, just like Lee said, uh, throw in things to consider that, at least personally, I'd never considered before. So we're delighted to have her here. Please welcome Camille Salcedo. Hey, Camille. Hey, Eric. How are you? How are you doing? I'm doing great. Life is pretty good considering uh, I count my blessings daily. <laughs> I think that's something we can all sympathize with. I, yeah. I, I feel like the question, how are you, has, has become so homogenized. Uh, over the past year or so, like it means the same thing to everybody and everybody's answer almost means the same thing. Yeah, that's why I try and avoid the whole like, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't really tell you anything, but you know, I, I'm 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 actually doing really well, pandemic and all concerned. Uh it's been a a rough year, but um, you know, I, I realize that I'm in a pretty good place, especially compared to some people. So I, I appreciate that part <laughs> and I try to keep Absolutely. that in mind when things are frustrating. So. I think the situation is, has a, a allowed a lot of us to uh, allow gratitude into our feelings and, and for what we do have. Um, question, book-wise, are you reading anything currently or have you read anything recently that you really enjoyed? Um, I have literally just finished last night uh, rereading a collection of short stories by N.K. Jeminson, which is called How Long Until Black Future Month. Um, and it's, it's fabulous. I mean, it's a science fiction story collection and I'm, I'm madly in love with N.K. Jeminson. So um, yeah, and since February is right around the corner, I decided to reread re that collection of short stories. So. I am writing that down. N.K. Jeminson? I'm gonna look that up. That sounds great. Yeah, all of all of uh, NK's books are fantastic. Uh, if you're a big science fiction fan like I am, I highly recommend them to everyone I know. <laughs> you definitely check it out. And for everybody watching, um, in the video description after the show, uh, give it about a day or so. But we are going to include all the books and and television and movies that everybody's been talking about. In case it sounds interesting to you, and you're like, "What was that? Where do I find it?" We'll let you know. Um, great. So uh, Camille, we're going to bring you back for the conversation in just one moment. Um, but we have one more panelist to introduce you uh, all to tonight. And uh, and this panelist is dear to my heart in so many ways. Um, she is a story coach, a holistic health coach. She is a model. She is the executive producer of the Mystery Box Show. And if you're familiar at all with our channel or our podcast, you're familiar with her. Um, you can see her modeling work on Instagram at Happy Apple PDX. And uh, will you please all welcome Reba Sparrow? Hi, Reba. Well, hello. How are you tonight? I'm good. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Um, like I said, Reba is not only the host of our podcast, but she's also the host of the Mystery Box Show Storytelling uh, Show, which we have coming up on Valentine's Day, our next show. Uh, tickets on sale now at mysteryboxshow.com. It's going to be uh, a juicy one. We have incredible storytellers coming up this time. I mean, we always do. Like, we always say, like, this time they're great, as if other times we're like, yeah, you know. <laughs> But they're all they're always great. I think that's one of the fun things about the past eight years. Like, are you just surprised every single time? Yeah, I am actually. And I also think there's a special magic energy to the Valentine's show. Um, just uh, I think people who have never heard of the Mystery Box show before will often be introduced to it through because of Valentine's Day. It's like a sex thing to do on Valentine's Day. And so that's exciting. So it's a, a little bit of a different energy about the Valentine show that I think is always really fun. I agree. Yeah, totally. Um, a getting to know you question before we dive into the show. You actually had specifically requested to be asked about books as well. So are you reading anything currently that you'd like to talk about? Well, Eric, I'm glad you asked. 
Oh, I'm um, so glad I yes. did. <laughs> yes, I currently am, have it right here with me. Um, I'm currently reading The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. And if you're familiar with Erin Morgenstern, she wrote The Night Circus, which I believe was her very first and only novel up until this one. Um, it's magic realism at its finest. Um, I am a I am a nut for the night circus. And so when I learned that there was the starless sea, I had to have it. I am about one sixteenth of the way through and I already like it better than the night circus. Um, I, 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 as a reader and not necessarily a writer, every, I feel like I want to have a highlighter just because every turn of phrase is like brilliant and the book is brilliant and it's magic and it's amazing. And I love it. So Aaron Einstein, so starts to be Pulling back the curtain a little bit uh, for people who don't know, Reba and I um, are married and we're actually, as, as much as we try to uh, maintain the illusion tonight, we are actually in the same house. We are, we're just <laughs> up and downstairs from one another. Um, all of which is to say that, that th this has been my experience of Reba reading this book. Every 45 seconds or so, anytime I'm nearby, she's reading it, there will be this sound. <gasps> Ooh. <laughs> it, it it makes people make sounds. Um, it is, I can't wait to, to read it myself when she's done with it. Um, so yeah, so that is uh, a great recommendation. Reba, I'm gonna take you off screen just for the moment before we bring everybody back um, because we are ready to start the show. So I, obviously you've met our panelists. Now uh, let's dive in. Here's the rules for tonight. We'll start with the introduction of a topic, and then our panelists are going to talk to each other through conversation, discuss their experiences, et cetera. And if you're watching and you have a comment, either on Facebook or on YouTube, type in your question and Nicole can catch those and uh, insert them into the conversation um, at the appropriate point. Uh, it's it's all anonymous if you'd like to, uh, It's you can be anonymous if you'd like to be anonymous. Um, otherwise, we can put your name up on the screen feel free to say if you're comfortable with that. But let's dive in. Uh, our first topic tonight, I'm gonna click this button. Our first topic tonight is sexual citizenship. Now, some of you, I'm going to guess, might not have heard this term before. And the only reason I'm guessing that is because when this topic was suggested, I had never heard this term before. Um, this topic was uh, suggested by Alison Moon and uh, and I've done a little bit of research to try to understand this, this concept of sexual citizenship. From my basic understanding, it encompasses the idea of how sexuality applies to political and cultural existence in society. Um, I, I even saw one article that was, uh, that was talking about how when we talk about like, you know, a person, imagine a person in our culture, there's a tendency most people will have to picture a straight white male and uh, a straight white cisgendered male, I should say. And the concept of sexual citizenships ask us, asks us to challenge that mindset and create and broaden our language and thinking to create a less centralized personhood and, and really consider all people. So that's my basic understanding. I might be completely off base and we'll find out uh, where I am. So I'm going to bring everybody into the conversation now. Um, we have Nicole, Camille, Reva, Allison, and Lee. And Allison, if you don't mind, I'd love to start with you. Um, based on your understanding, how was that for a, a primer on sexual citizenship? I thought it was a great introductory definition. I think that the way I consider sexual citizenship, to make it a little bit more personal, is that it's the way that we, the way that any individual explores, pursues, and has sex influences every other aspect of our lives it and it influences how we show up in community and how we show up in society. There is this tendency in our culture, specifically American culture, to separate and to isolate sexuality from everything else and to treat it like this black box that we only open when we're in bed with a specific person at a specific time. And sexual citizenship asks us to kind of open that box and acknowledge that sex is part of our lives. It's part of how we move through the world. It's part of how we are 
neighbors, it's part of how we are parents, it's part of how we are citizens, and that we need to be more uh, aware of that because that affects how how our relationships, even platonic ones, form and how we show up in the world on a regular basis. That's uh, That definitely broadens my understanding. It, it, it almost feels like, I remember here thinking this when I heard the topic, um, that it almost sounds like this idea of the environment and how we treat ourselves like environmentally globally as you know there's the environment and then what we can do about it as as, as opposed to considering ourselves as part of the mm -hmm. environment the ecosystem right. and it feels like this is sort of the sexual uh sexual lens through which to see that kind of uh, perspective is that Absolutely. Yeah. I think that I think the ecological angle is a really good one. We are not separate from the world looking down on it like we're scientists examining something through a microscope. We are of it. And we need to get out of this idea that we are stewards rather that we are part of it. And it's same thing with sexuality, even if you are asexual, that there is the, your lack of sexual interest or sexual desire is still a part of you and how you show up in the world. And I think the, the analogy you had mentioned about this notion of true neutral of a cis white heterosexual man as the neutral human being in our minds and then everybody else being marked is a really great way for us to perceive that too that everyone who doesn't have sex like that imaginary man has is somehow always bringing sex into their lives this notion that you know lgbt rights are always like they're always shoving their sexuality in people's faces it's like no we're just acknowledging that our sexuality is part of how we show up in the world and that straight people have been able to have the privilege to invisibilize that part of themselves and rather than that privilege we want to acknowledge that everyone's sexuality is a part of who they are in the world period and with what you're talking about there, I think there's also the issue of, you know, you bring up the notion of privilege. If you are someone who is, say, if we look at uh, classist issues, right, class issues, if you're somebody who is working three jobs to be able to afford to live, where is the space for sexuality in your life? Where is the space for that piece of your authentic self? And so the perception that, oh, if you don't have a sex life, it's because your libido is low or it's because, you know, no, you're not having a relationship right now. Well, it's also at play with a wide variety of other cultural issues and other points of oppression in this world. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's intersectionality at work. I mean, intersectionality is such a big word and so many people are so afraid of it, but it really just means examining how these things interact and contrast and, and amplify other aspects of our lives. And, you know, the way that we see motherhood is very different for white middle class women than it is for, you know, indigenous lesbians. It's very different. And we have to acknowledge that, you know, being a mother, being a lesbian, being a woman, being whatever, they're not all the one thing. There's no one way to be a woman. There's no one way to be a sexual person. And acknowledging that diversity and acknowledging that those issues are intricately related to everything in our lives, the politics, the class, the race, the religion, all of these things are all part of the same whole. And sex is not something that you can just kind of add in at will or erase at will. It's always there with us, just like any other aspect of our identity is. I'm really yeah. enjoying this definition. <laughs> I have to say, because Eric and I have, been, I have never heard the term either. And so I really appreciate you bringing it to the table, Allison. And what's coming up for me, I'm just going to bring a, a separate thing. Um, Cause I was like, I, I have nothing to contribute. Cause I don't even understand. Um, but now hearing you talk, I'm like, I do have something to contribute. Um, I will often be asked um, if I'm on, if I'm being interviewed or something like that, people will often say to me, Oh, you, you were the executive producer of this, the show where you, people talk about their sex lives and that's so taboo. And you're so open about your sex life. You talk about it all the time. And um, how, how did you come to be that way? And I had to think about it for a long time before I came up with my standard answer because I was like, I don't know, I just am this way. What do you mean? Um, but I had to think about it. And I grew up in Germany. Uh, well, not grew up entirely, but I was there for four years in my formative years. My dad was forced. And this always came to mind that Sesame Street would be playing in German uh, on the TV, but the opening credits were different than the American ones in that there would be naked children running around a fountain 
and nudity was just like presented to children as integrated nudity. And then eventually, of course, that leads into sexuality. It doesn't have to, but it often does. Or um, being, being at public swimming pools and nudity is the standard. And then it was like uh, bathing suits were optional was the minority. Um, and then just in general, kind of being in Europe that sex ain't no thing. Um, totally what you're saying, Alex, and like integrated into our lives. And I think for me, having grown up that way or being there in, in those informative years just sort of informed my constitution in a way that isn't true for everybody. And I would say, especially in America. Is that kind of what you're saying is that it's like, it's the integration part of it, as opposed to that you said that privilege, like I'm hiding this part of of who we are. And why do we do that anyway? <laughs> you don't have thoughts on that? Like, where did that come from? The hiding of it, the secrecy of sexuality? Well, I mean, culturally in the United States, uh, we treat sexuality as this default, right? Everybody is heterosexual, everybody's white, everybody has got the same uh, status and the, the ability to have time and relationships. Um, and so, anything outside of that is considered taboo for public conversation. And it's just, I mean, personally, I find it kind of asinine, but you know, it, it's a cultural issue. Uh, we treat sex very strangely in America as though anything that, um, any of our identities that, that link to our sexuality are, are shamed and things that we are supposed to be hiding, at least um, a large percentage of the public believes that to be the case. Um, especially when you diverge from that um, that uh, concept of default human being the white straight cisgendered male, so mm -hmm. and I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, when you when you take the time to to investigate your own identities and how those affect how you show up in the world it's a lot. I mean, and it takes time and it evolves over your lifetime. And if you pretend like pieces of you don't exist, it's very hard to get through. If I could uh, interject some, this reminds me of something I heard the other day on a podcast. Um, and if anybody can speak to this, um, this idea of what was I hearing? Basically sex educators, um, some people are advocating sex education start as early as preschool or kindergarten. And of course, there's people who are, you know, uh, throwing up uh, in, in arms. I don't know the term, uh, <laughs> but, but are railing against that idea because they're like, no, 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 you can't teach a kindergartner how to fuck, uh, <laughs> which, which, is a, which is almost an intentional misunderstanding of right. what sexual education might be in kindergarten. And this person was saying that no, the idea would be that maybe you just teach about asking somebody before you touch them. Like even if, you know, may I, may I move you out of the way or may I direct you here? Or a doctor might say, may I touch you? Instead of just going in like, yes, I am touching you with no consent. Mm -hmm. And just instill the idea of consent. Um, and I'm wondering how that would inform the idea of sexual citizenship, sort of awaken it in people that, that this is a thing to be considered. I think, um, Allison, you used the word intersectionality. And I think when I was looking up sexual citizenship, there's a lot of academic papers. And I think intersectionality is another word that comes down from academia that mm -hmm. feels uh, feels like a barrier for the lay people like me to be like, oh, I don't even think I even understand that. It's just, is that just what the eggheads are talking about these <laughs> days? Um, how do you, Allison, you, you speak on this sort of stuff a lot and you're so articulate about it. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you transverse trans, transverse that barrier of academia into just normal conversation? Well, I think the I mean I think that it's a, it's a challenge for sure. I think that you know using large words is problematic sometimes because it, pro problematic is another one of those words. Um, because yeah, I, I I certainly don't ever want people to feel like they don't know enough to be able to have candid conversations about sexuality, right? Like we are all we all have the right to be experts in our own sexuality, and I think that that's something that a lot of us feel alienated from as well. This idea that there is there are experts and then there are the rest of us. Um, but I think that, you know, speaking to the idea of like age appropriate sex education, like 
another big part of it is that in our culture, and I'm speaking kind of broadly about what our culture even is, there are microcultures in America, I'm not gonna say that there aren't, but like dominant American culture likes to act as though children aren't sexual. Human beings are sexual in the fetus, like in, in the womb onward, in different ways. We develop on our own and we develop sexuality at a specific, our, our pace, if we're so lucky as to develop it at our own pace. So fetuses, self-pleasure, infants, self-pleasure. There's that like children understand pleasure and they understand love and I think that there is plenty to talk about. When we think about sex education, we have this notion that sex is like we're taught teaching like the the like the the nitty gritty details, right? But it's like sex education absolutely includes consent and boundaries and knowing I don't like it when grandma kisses me. So why do I have to let grandma kiss me? And having those conversations with mom and dad about like like what if I what if I could do something else with that still shows her that I love her, right? But this is not a conversation most parents are having with their children about sexual, like about body sovereignty, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of us kind of, we we hit this like um, not arbitrary barrier at like 18 years old, <laughs> suddenly we're supposed to know everything about our bodies when we've been denied all of that information from birth to adulthood. And so I think that when we talk about like comprehensive sexual education, when we talk about sexual citizen, it's talking about acknowledging the human being as an organism within this complex world. And that sexuality isn't just about the nitty gritty of genitals. It's also about communication and it's about love and it's about God. And it's about all of our relationships with how we move through the world. And that the more we can have those conversations, the better. And that's kind of another buzzword, sex positivity, right? There, there's so many different definitions about sex positivity and you're gonna get a different definition from anybody you ask. But in my mind, it's, it's be acknowledging that the more we talk about it, the more we integrate that stuff into our lives, the better society is, the better we show up as parents, children, family, friends lovers, and that we need to be able to continually engage in the conversation. Uh, I have something to contribute from the from the audience, um, sort of along the lines of, I think, intersectionality and the different identities that we bring to the table. I'm actually going to bring the comment up on the screen. I don't know if you guys can see it as well behind the scenes, um, but sort of the perspective of someone who might um, bring something to the table uh, who has a disability that's not visible and then how that might change once that identity is brought out and just sort of, I don't know if you all have something to comment on that too, sort of the idea of, um, I think it's interesting that the conversation changes once something is brought out that maybe wasn't known before, even though it doesn't change, like it's still the same person sitting in front of you that you were just talking to, but now you have a piece of information that maybe you didn't know before. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Thank you. Um, so I have a dear, dear friend who is um, finishing up her work to become an occupational therapist and their focus, I'm sorry, they are finishing up their work to become an occupational therapist and their focus is on disability and sexuality um, because in a lot of ways, um, the general public behaves as though people with disabilities, visible or non-visible, are non-sexual. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a huge thing that, you know, this is this is something that is important in all of our lives. And understanding that <coughs> they're capable and allowed and encouraged to have sexuality and understand their sexuality and what they want and what they need and the kinds of touch and the kinds of experiences that they're looking for is a, a a really important area that is vastly ignored by most of our, our society and in, in a lot of cases in our medical um, experiences like doctors don't want to talk to their uh, patients about their sexuality unless you know they're your OBGYN or something um, and uh, so yeah I think that that whole question of, of uh, the realization that you have a disability and the people suddenly assuming that you have no sexuality um, because of that is, is a huge problem in our culture. And it's interesting. I, oh, go ahead, please. Well, uh, thank you, Lee. Um, I wonder too, sort of going off of what Allison said, like we're not taught about our 
bodies and then all of a sudden we're supposed to know what to do with them sexually. I think for a lot of people then trying to figure out their own sexuality and then transferring that to, okay, now I'm supposed to know other people's sexualities and okay, I've got this one thing down. I think I know these moves and this, and then you throw something at me that I didn't, exp I'm not speaking for me, I'm just speaking in general. Um, and then you get this piece of information, like Nicole says, or like this, this commenter is, says, and I wonder if some of that is just people's own, just insecurities about like, I assumed that you didn't have, that you're not a sexual being because I wasn't taught anything about that. And like, maybe that's just it. Like we're not taught yeah, we're just not taught that there are all different kinds of people, <laughs> basically. If that, and I, I, I think we infantilize a variety of life experiences that people have in this country, right? Like whether it is um, elders, whether it is youth, like we've been talking about, uh, whether it is people with disabilities, whatever it might be, right? There's certain populations that we don't. It's not that we don't assume that they have a sexuality. That is definitely a piece of it. But whatever sexuality they have is highly monitored and controlled in some way, shape, or form. Uh, upstate New York, one of the highest uh, uh, populations of HIV spreading, this was a few years ago, but was in, um, in elder care facilities because condoms were considered a medical device and therefore had to be approved by people's medical um, uh, oversight people, right? If, if your children happened to have control over your medical care, suddenly your children are having to approve your condoms, right? And so that kind of piece where we're not looking holistically at a human being causes profound harm. And I hear the the listener on the um, in the chat about the idea of, of invisible disabilities. Yes, it's 80% of, of folks who have some form of disability are not someone in a wheelchair that you can see has something that is variant about their life experience uh, and has something modify their life experience, right? Uh, it's, it's things like Tourette's. It's things like people with various seizure disorders. It's things like people with, you know, there, I mean, there's a wide variety, right? And yet that word disability suddenly shoves people into this category. And I think one of the challenges with this sex ed that conversation is that the word sex is what's at the front of the education. Mm -hmm. If we use the word that Allison brought up of body autonomy, mm -hmm. what if this was a, a, you know, a holistic look at not just the physical behaviors, but a curriculum over the course of a lifetime around consent? relationship styles, love styles, how we connect to other human beings and made it this broader look. I don't know if it would actually take some of the fear off of it because I think the word sex being shoved at the front of the education scares some people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that's a, that makes me think of like, I, I don't know if this is the case in your work too, but so many of my clients are older and there's this idea that at some point they're supposed to have everything figured out. And then suddenly they're in their 60s and they've fallen in love with somebody of the same gender for the first time in their lives and are freaking out about it. Or they are encountering an STI because they thought they kind of couldn't get them anymore because they're too old or they're not you know, slutty enough or whatever it is. And, like, and they're having all these, or their body's changing. And the last time anybody talked about their body's changing was puberty, right? <laughs> so all of like, and I talk about this in my workshops, like I say this, like, should we all be so lucky as to grow old? we're going to see changes in our bodies and our sexuality. And every time I've said this line in my workshops, people look at me strange. Like we should be excited to grow old. <laughs> and again, for me, I'm like, we should be grateful. So many people are denied that privilege in this world, right? But we have this, this idea that at one point, some point you're gonna stop wanting to get laid. You're, you're gonna, and some people do, but a lot of us are sexual to the day we die. And that's something that we also need to discuss that like elderly people are sexual and every different kind of person can be sexual. And this is, and I think it also has to do with representation, right? Like in the in this example from the reader talking about their disability and the people kind of scooting as soon as they learn about it, 
that also comes from the media. Like we don't have positive representations of people with disabilities getting hella laid, right? I would like to see a Marvel movie where somebody's getting hella laid and they have a disability, <laughs> right? Like there's just not that kind of comfort talking about this. And I want, so I think that like, it has a lot to do with the way we re represent sexuality in mainstream culture. Like who gets to have sex in culture? Who gets to get laid in our culture? And most of the time, it's not the people who are actually getting laid in this world, which is to say people of color, people of trans experience, people with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. But those people have sex lives too. And I'd like to see more of that in this world. Well, and yeah. you, people were asking earlier, how does that body type, right? A cisgender white person, why is mm -hmm. that the normalized you know, body shape that's shown? It's because in sex ed books, the vulvas that are shown are white. Mm -hmm. The penises that are shown are circumcised white penises. Mm -hmm. And so, and if that's what you're seeing, I mean, in Italy, there's a, um, I was talking to a sexologist over there and he was saying that the largest growing population of people requesting Viagra are people under the age of 16 because all they've seen is men in pornography who can get it up immediately, not realizing that that is outside the norm of body response. Mm -hmm. And so here, if, if that's the only examples you're being shown, of successful sexuality. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Talk about affecting the ego and self-identity for the rest of a lifetime mm -hmm. on so many levels, not just on the sexual level. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna so, break in for just a moment with only a, a, a couple minutes left for this topic. And I, I almost feel like when we do these shows, we should just have one topic for the entire night. We could go <laughs> on and on. Um, but the, but I, I hear a lot about, um, about areas where we could be doing better. And there's there's so many of those, and it's important to recognize those. But I'm curious, have you seen any places where there's a model for doing things right? Reba, the way that you mentioned Sesame Street, just having naked children and it being no big deal, being just established as not a big deal. Um, do you know about other cultures, other countries, other societies, or even within our own that are doing things right? What can we do? How can we engage? How can we how can we be better sexual citizens? Well, I want to make sure that Camille also gets heard because she did, got cut off there, if that's all right with you, Eric. Mm -hmm. totally. I'm so sorry, I didn't awesome. mean to, Camille, please. Well, um, I uh, was just going to point out, I, I literally just had a conversation about um, this with my mom because I'm always talking to my mom and I adore her. Um, because a friend of mine had made a comment about how they were worried that their kids were going to learn about sex from some school teenage idiot, you know, at school and, and not learn anything useful. And I, my first thought was, well, why are you waiting until your kid is a teenager to talk to them about anything like this? And so I, I had a really good conversation with my mom about her decisions um, when raising her kids as a single mother of four um, and how, you know, she made a point to teach us all our body parts, for example, because like, your average preschooler is taught about their head and their shoulders and their arms and their fingers and their toes and their legs and nothing from their neck to their thighs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, how those just small steps, you know, every piece of that is starts when you're so little and you teach them as is appropriate and this comes up with them as they get older. And so um, this idea where people are, 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 not aware of their bodies and not aware of sex and not aware of uh, bodily autonomy or, or consent. Um, and, and, and the idea that we as a group can make decisions to teach our children better. But a lot of us, you know, we're grown now. It's, it's too late to go back and teach a 14 year old woman, you know, 14 year old girl who's now a 50 year old woman, these things. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have to look forward, we have to learn them for ourselves, and we have to teach the future generations. Um, and that, that was just the point I wanted to make where we talk about sexuality is not limited to this thing that happens when you hit puberty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was going to be my, um, <laughs> that's what I was going to ask, right, as Eric asked it, what do we do now? Um, mm -hmm. And and I, I'm hearing a lot of like, yeah, well, this is how we can start with our children, but what about like, Camille, you just said towards the end there, what about the grown adults, uh, us, us now? 
Um, I know, you know, watching things like this conversation is a good start, but what else is there in the world? Eric, was that kind of what you were asking, like for adults to um, expand our sex, sexual citizenship or to improve upon it, so to speak, I guess is the right word. It was, yeah. And this also might dovetail into the next conversation, which, uh, which, which we'll have to move on to shortly. Uh, but I also want to tie this idea back to something, Lee, that that came up when when you used the word marathon earlier um, as, as as a better word and and having these moments where we can say like oh yeah I can question myself and say like can I be doing things better I think it's such an important skill um, for all of us to develop this idea of of asking ourselves if we are wrong instead of saying we are set in our ways and this is how it should be because it's how it's always been and it seems to have worked okay for me, therefore I'm not changing anything. I'm not going to assume that I have anything new to learn. Um, and I'm going to use that as a transition into our next topic. Um, as I introduce this, our next topic is problematic artists. Um, and actually fortuitously, so, uh, as, as, as we've been talking about this uh, this topic, problematic artists around Mystery Box Show HQ these past couple of weeks, we've sort of been subtitling it, can I still like Harry Potter? Um, but we actually, we actually wanted this to be a broader topic of conversation than just Harry Potter, but that, I think that's gonna be a good lens to use, as, uh, especially given events of the past six months with JK Rowling. If, if anybody doesn't know, I'll give a, a quick highlight reel, but actually, uh, with great timing this morning on glamour.com. Um, I'll give a shout out to uh, the journalist, Abby Gardner, who basically wrote a timeline of everything that has happened with, uh, with, with JK Rowling and some comments that were made. Um, but let's see, how, how, how to break this down quickly for anybody who, uh, who isn't up to speed on this. About six months ago, JK Rowling, the creator of Harry Potter, began to express some opinions that uh, that hinted at the idea that she might not fully embrace the the reality of transgender people's identities, um, and and more and more fans looked to J.K. Rowling to sort of amend her comments and clarify her position. Hopefully, saying you know like oh no 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 what I meant was, um, but she appeared to double down more and more on her initial comments, leading people to see her as transphobic or, uh, or or this term, if you're not familiar with a TERF, which uh, T-E-R-F, which stands for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. Um, other examples you may have heard of this are, for example, uh, women only spaces or music festivals, for example, who deny access to trans women because they're not, um, they're not seen as being genuinely women um, or, 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 or invading a safe space. So, like I said, we're, we're not going to try to make this a discussion specifically about J.K. Rowling, but that will be the primary lens we use. Uh, because the upshot of this, of, of this specific example is that millions upon millions of Harry Potter fans who fell in love with the series, uh, including many LGBTQ Harry Potter fans, um, just found the entire Harry Potter universe uh, embraced the differences in people and bullies are vilified and the acceptance of everybody was the aspiration for for everything and now with these comments uh from the creator of that universe that seems to be antithetical to that uh to that embracing what do we do with this and obviously jk rowling isn't the first artist nor will she be the last that uh, that the personal opinions and politics appear at art at odds with the work they create or the fandom that's been created. So the question is, what do we do with this? How do we compartmentalize? Do you compartmentalize? Um, and I would imagine that that we've all had experiences like this with the art that we've loved or the artists that we have questioned. So with that, I'm going to bring the panel back and uh, and ask anybody if they would like to open the conversation. <laughs> I would like to open, please, uh, because this was my this topic was my baby. Um, I'm a huge Harry Potter fan, and when all this came out about J.K. Rowling, I I've been saying this for weeks. I was like, I need therapy around this. Like, what are people doing? I can't 
you know, I, I can't wear my Harry Potter hoodie <laughs> anymore or, or God forbid, like have someone else see me wearing it um, because what will they think that I think about them or about mm -hmm. trans people or about you? Do I support her? Or like, it's just so confusing and awful um, for me. <laughs> and so I talked to a few people here and there and a couple people said, well, you know, there've been lots of problems throughout history. Um, I think the one person I asked said, I still listen to Michael Jackson. Um, and I, I've, what I've come to, um, there's a, a disconnect for me, I think, which is a lot of the problematic artists in history, and that's all different artists across all different mediums, they're no longer here in the present. So it does, there's a disconnect. It, it's there, it's more forgiving for some reason. We can divorce the artist from the art because they're not in modern times living our reality with us. That's how I'm perceiving this. And so with JK Rowling, she is here living in our present and very much a part of our everyday reality and like integrated into, it's integrated the clothes I wear, the things that I say and the, the, the uh, other, the magic realism books that I love, you know, that all came from Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, don't, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> um, I, okay, I, I'd want, like to share one thing that your, what your please. comment is specifically bringing up. There are a million ways into this conversation. It's one of my favorite conversations as well. I'm glad you brought it up. But I think what you're speaking to Reba is this feeling of feeling complicit in somebody else's hate, right? Because you've supported with capital, you've given money to this person. And with like Michael Jackson, with dead artists, like you don't necessarily, a person might not necessarily feel as guilty because they're not actively financially supporting a person's agenda in the world, right? And so I think right. that this comes down to a personal exploration of like what this art means to me and do I feel like I'm still allowed to love it? And I think that this is where I get a little bit frustrated with this current kind of cultural movement towards standing, where we act as though every artist is not a real person and a politi politicians aren't real people. And, and, and I don't want me to minimize hate, right? Like I'm not suggesting that th there is a, there's a huge scale of like, somebody said something crappy once to somebody's funding hate groups, right? And I'm not suggesting that we're talking about any artist that's anywhere on there, but, um, I think that what you, what any individual has to do is like examine, like I know plenty of trans people who have been very harmed by JK Rowling's words. And this is, and to just to correct your timeline, Eric, this goes back way longer than six months. Yeah. She has been very virulently hateful for years. It's reached the mainstream, but people have known about this for a while. Um, Thank you for that correction. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but, the, the, but at the same time, I know so many trans people who have been so deeply moved by the Harry Potter universe who've, who've invested so much emotional energy into this world. And I would never tell any person that they cannot love something anymore because the creator is a, is a hateful person. And I think that that would, any, any person who tries to be an arbiter as to what somebody else can find joy in is immediately suspect in my mind. But I think that this is why it's such an interesting topic is we're also talking about capitalism. We're also talking about supporting art. We're also talking about, you know, what we're, how, how our interactions with an artist and the art are separate and at the same time the same. And so I think this is where, you know, teasing that out for oneself is a really useful skill set. And it's a really useful technique for anything because so often what happens now is you find out that your favorite poet said something shitty 30 years ago. And now you wonder if you can still enjoy that poetry. And I think that this is where, a little bit of um, resilience around understanding like how difficult these conversations are and how your own choice, your own kind of moral stance on what your feelings are about with how you want to personally engage with art, I think is a really great place to start. One of the silver linings I've also seen out of this situation is, um, is seeing allies of transgender people actually ally actually do the work. Because if transgender people have to be the ones going out there and being like, no, I exist, right? This is not an identity. This is not something I can put on from time to time. I am authentic. Mm -hmm. I am a human. <laughs> and this is who I am in the world, right? If they're the ones having to go out, it becomes this fatigue, right? This heartache to have to constantly say, I exist. 
I have value. And the number of transgender people that are murdered every single year, that notion of our lives having value is important. And to me, that silver line that's come out is I have seen people who are cisgender, right? And for folks who don't know and aren't familiar with the language we've been using, trans means across, right? Somebody who started here and is now somewhere else, right? For a lot of people, it's binary, right? Female to male, male to female, et cetera. But there's a lot of other gender experiences worldwide, not just in, in English and American understandings uh, of gender. But, and cis means whatever your doctor or midwife or whomever brought, you know, brought the baby up, they said, it's a blank, whatever the blank is. Cis means that as an adult or as a kid or whatever, you still identify with and you know you are whatever that word was the doctor said, right? And I've met a lot of cis people, cisgender people through this process who are actually actively allying by making it so that transgender people don't have to keep defending their very existence and are going up there and speaking up and showing up. And to me, that silver lining is the fact that I don't feel alone, that there are people who are not walking my path. And for folks who don't know, I was assigned female at birth. And for, for folks who, you know, having folks show up so that I can step back and breathe and other people are saying, you matter, you exist, and we are speaking up for you has been invaluable and heart touching. That's incredible. Can I can I ask a side question off of that, Lee? And I and I hope I'm using this term correctly. I feel like I'm tripping all over language tonight and 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 learning a lot in it. Um, can can you say a little bit about the the difference you might have seen between what you're calling allyship and what some what some people might call white knighting, which is which my understanding is basically I will stand up for you because like. I believe that you need someone to stand up for you. Right. My understanding and how I look at the world with that is the idea that, that if somebody is allying, it's doing the work, understanding what needs done from the population that needs it, and then going and doing that work that the population actually needs as compared to saying, I have this vision, I've never talked to a transgender person, but I have a vision of what they need. And it's putting, rather than lifting up the voices and needs of a population, it is projecting upon that population. And when somebody is allying and they have a stage, right, they finally have a place where they're speaking, they also look to the population they're speaking for and saying, hey, I have this stage, who wants it? And then stepping back. To me, this is, for example, if people are doing um, racial allyship and you're doing activism work for uh, uh, in, in the workplace, as an example, it's taking that moment and saying, hey, this goes back to capitalism, right? Hey, is there a person of color who can come and do the work that I can give the money to because we now have this work that is being done? So to me, that's how I, I look at it. I, look I appreciate you, that. You are actively nodding with some of that stuff. No, that's a great clarification. I appreciate it. Um, Camille, we haven't heard from you yet. Did you well, like um, I was going to say on this topic as a whole, um, I read a great article uh, online um, that was called everything I love is problematic <laughs> and, um, it really resonated with me because I feel that way a lot especially when you take a closer look at the stuff you know the, the popular culture and the music and the people and the artists that you've been familiar with you know since you were a teenager if you go back and when you watch you know, 16 candles and you're like, oh my God, that's a rape scene. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't catch it when you were 14 and you thought it was the greatest thing ever to watch a John Hughes film. But you, you learn about those things as you get older and you have to come to terms with that. And you have to decide how you want to respond. For mm -hmm. example, I am a massive Harry Potter fan. I heard a review of Harry Potter on NPR 
And it was the first book had just been released in America. I bought five copies that day on my way home from work and I gave them out. I kept one for me <laughs> and I gave them out to um, pretty much all the kids in my family that were, and, and my friends that were of an age to be reading something like that. Um, and I had, I, you know, I've introduced probably 50, 60 people to Harry Potter in that way. Um, and I love Harry Potter, but I had to come to terms with JK Rowling being really, really a problem in my life and how the things that she says and does affect the people that matter to me. And so I had to come to terms with that. Like, you know, do I, I don't believe in burning books. Do I give away my Harry Potter books? Um, do I just pretend like, you know, that was a different era and it doesn't matter? Uh, but I mean, for me, the big decision had to come down to, well, I can't unlike the things that I like about Harry Potter, even when I was reading it and I realized, you know, like a lot of the non-white people in Harry Potter are really awful stereotypes. But there are good things about Harry Potter too, and I don't want to give up on those, but I have made a conscious decision that I don't buy any Harry Potter merchandising, any licensed Harry Potter work, because I don't feel like I want to put my money into something that will benefit J.K. Rowling. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that way about a lot of things, you know, a lot of artists that are problematic for one reason or another. I don't buy any more R. Kelly music and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't pretend like those things aren't there. And if I'm having a conversation with somebody about something like that, I, I feel like I should point out like, yes, I watched 16 Candles again. If you're gonna watch this with your teenagers, please make sure they're aware that is a rape thing. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, you can't watch Gone with the Wind and pretend like it's not happening, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think for me personally, that's, that's the line that has to be drawn. Like you have to acknowledge where things are problematic and then decide how you're going to respond to that. And if that means like you never listen to Miles Davis again or something, or, you know, you avoid Picasso exhibit or, <laughs> or, or you know, you, you, you no longer, you know, go to the thriller dance every <laughs> half week. Uh, whatever that thing is for you, that's your choice. But you, you've got to understand that we are surrounded constantly by things that are problematic, whether we're aware of the problematic bits yet or not. And as we get older, you will find more and more problematic things in the things that you loved. I mean, I, 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 I was an avid reader as a kid and I went back and reread some books that literally changed my life when I was a teenager. And they are so, I couldn't even recommend them now to other people. <laughs> There's so much in them that is just not okay with me, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I think that what, what you're speaking to Camille kind of reminds me of what Eric closed the last section with this idea of like this, like admitting that we're fallible, like being willing to admit that like we are problematic. Everything you love is problematic because like we live under white supremacy. Like I'm a white person. I benefit from white supremacy. Like just existing, I am hurting other people. And I, I it, it's important for everybody to acknowledge this. I think there's this need because we have this binary thinking of like heroes and villains and no, no there's nothing in between. And so it becomes like J.K. Rowling's the best in the world we 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 like just at like just we just defy our the creators that we love such that when they do prove themselves to be either problematic or hateful or whatever it it hurts us on a core level it, it destroys our ego because our ego is attached to belief that they are a perfect person and then we have to do this really complex system of like negotiating with our own feelings and i think that we tend to, because it's painful, try and shy away from that. We don't want to engage with that. And so we tend to either say, cut it out. Like anybody who likes Harry Potter is a terrible person. And like, we just kind of put people into boxes so that we can just justify our own discomfort with these things. I think that the gift that comes with acknowledging that artists are people and people are problematic is, I, I think it encourages people to read closer. Like you were saying, Camille, like, J.K. Rowling's politics aren't that great in general. And maybe her transphobia actually allowed people to read Harry Potter closer and to look at 
her racial politics, her gender politics a little bit more thoughtfully. And I think that's a, sh that's a sign of love for art. That's a sign of connection with art that we are actually willing to engage with it on multiple levels. Like that's what I think art is for, right? And so if we have the opportunity to say like, okay, like I loved Call of Cthulhu when I was a kid. I didn't see any of the racial stuff. And now I totally see that H.P. Lovecraft was a racist piece of shit. Okay, great. You can read his stuff and you can see the racism in it and you can see where it comes from and you can still love Call of Cthulhu, but you can't, you cannot separate racism from H.P. Lovecraft's work. It's impossible. And you can see it and you cannot separate shitty sexual politics from a lot of John Hughes's work. It's part of it. But that doesn't mean you have to then erase it from the canon and pretend it doesn't exist. You have to acknowledge that this is an artifact of a time, of a person. How am I choosing to engage with that? Knowing these things now, having more information rather than less. Yeah, and I think what I'm hearing with that too is also note who you're consuming, whose work we're looking at, right? So if Harry Potter is feeling problematic and when I'm looking at there's all these racial stereotypes, et cetera, what about turning to black fantasy authors mm -hmm. and consuming other voices? I, I would strongly recommend, for example, Nanetti Akora Four's series, Akata mm -hmm. Witch. Mm -hmm. Amazing series about a group of young witches who are exploring like how do they level up and who do they learn from, but looking at it from a lens of Nigerian culture. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, that puts me into a different place. And if we look at the words, of different peoples, we learn new things. If I look at art from different cultures, I have different forms of movement in my heart. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's also looking at your looking at my bookshelf and seeing what's in this, who are the, who are speaking in it? And mm -hmm. am I hearing the voices that will wake me up in different ways? Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, the other thing I've been looking at is almost all, like all of the voices we just mentioned were all white authors or producers. Mm -hmm. I'm squinting, which one didn't, wasn't? R. Kelly is not white. <laughs> <laughs> no, R. Kelly is definitely, and Michael Jackson is. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of the book. <laughs> Coming from. Yes. My brain went to the books, not the <laughs> My well, sincere apologies. Mm -hmm. oh, it, it, it's easy because we throw out a lot of names. Mm -hmm. but, well, but it also tells you which voices did I hear. <laughs> but seriously, like, wh where are my biases in even listening to what we were talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, for sure. I, it, it, it almost makes me wonder, um, and I'd, I'd love to hear anybody's opinion on this. Um, Definitely looking outside of the comfort zone of, you know, what what I like to read, which tend to be people who look like me. Um, so looking outside of that comfort zone is helpful. But I, I, I wonder if the privilege hierarchy, the privilege ladder, does that sort of coincide with the problematic hierarchy? Are people who are more privileged more likely to be problematic? Um, or, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the author, uh, Lee, that you were just saying, uh, the Akata Witch series. Um, I'm sorry? Nnedi Akorafor. Nnedi Akorafor. Okay, I was trying to write that down. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and and Ni Nigerian, did you say? She's a Nigerian-American woman. Got it. She's, so amazing. I'm, she's amazing, and her science <laughs> fiction blows me away. I've read so all of her books. <laughs> So I'm curious, would Nnedi Okorafor be potentially problematic in examining her work? Or, again, I'm stumbling over my words, but like the, 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 the privilege hierarchy, is it, are privileged people more likely to be problematic, I guess is, is my main question. Well, to be really pithy, privileged people are more likely to be problematic in public because they're given public forums more often than people are. <laughs> So I mean, like, and I, and so like, that's the the obvious answer from an art perspective, um, but I'm sure other people have different opinions about that as well. Well, I was gonna say, like, for me personally, like, when you say I like to read books about people who look like me, guess what? Ninety five percent of books published aren't published by people who are brown. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't get published because you know it's like American Dirt, right? We have a white woman who's going to tell the story of Mexican people 
surviving as immigrants at the border because Hispanic women were not given an opportunity to write that book. Nobody mm -hmm. wanted to publish it because they were not sympathetic. I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. the whole, it's, it's such a part of everything mm -hmm. that you have the privilege that your voice gets heard, that your work gets put out there, that you get the spotlight, mm -hmm. right? Like I spent, I, I, I made a very concentrated effort for a year. I decided that my New Year's resolution for that year was I was not reading anything by cisgendered straight white men. Mm. And all of my friends who were, you know, big science fiction and fantasy fans were like, but, but, but Neil Gaiman. And I'm like, <laughs> right, Neil's books will still be there. <laughs> right? However many he publishes in that year, I'm not going <laughs> to never catch up with them if I really want to read them. But for this year, I am reading people who are marginalized in one or more ways. And that's it. I'm like, they, they're, they're LGBTQ, they're transgender, they're, they're people of color, they are disabled, they are something. They have perspectives that are majority ignored in our culture. And every book and every short story collection I read, and I collected from sources, I mean, I, I put it out on Facebook, hey, tell me about an author that I haven't heard of, that you think is amazing, and who is, how are they different than Neil Gaiman, mm -hmm. right? So, Camille, I'm really, I'm really, I'm really, sorry. I'm really loving this because in the, in the last topic, you know, my big question was, yeah, what do we do now? And so far, I've, I personally have taken two really good things out of this topic, um, one from Lee, in your silver lining about, oh yeah, this is an amazing opportunity for advocacy. And that feels like, you know, helping to answer the question or helping to at least go in the right direction of what do we do about this now? Um, okay, I'm gonna still like Harry Potter and I'm gonna be a better advocate. <laughs> and, and what Camille here is saying, um, yeah, reach reach beyond your comfort level as far as the arts that you are the art that you are consuming and and support you know, actively and intentionally do that type of work so i just wanted to acknowledge that that i'm really i loving what everyone has to say here if i could dovetail off of that oh please lee well i was gonna if we want to take it back specifically to sex also yeah. whose books on sexuality are we reading mm -hmm. which speakers like I loved when Kevin Allison came out with a book of um, uh, uh, love is um, love's not colorblind. Patterson. Patterson. Kevin Patterson. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wrong Kevin. That's a different. Thank you. Very different Kevin. About, so. Very different Kevin. Uh, but when he wrote love is not colorblind. <laughs> to have him point out all of the like a variety of issues in polyamory around these topics, right? And to have me pause and go, oh, most of the books on polyamory and non-monogamous non relationships I'd read were by a specific population. What am, again, this goes back to consuming and whose voices am I hearing as a sex educator? Whose voices am I listening to? What, what bodies am I seeing around sexuality? Whose conversations, whose articles are we reading? Whose blogs, mm -hmm. right? Because if we go back to, um, you know, who's getting published as books, the issue there that you're talking about is very true, very prevalent, but the internet is making other spaces available, mm -hmm. right? Is other, making other places. So where am I also consuming information that might be online? Who can I call to, to be like, hey, I wanna learn more about sexuality. Who do you know I haven't read yet? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna break in here uh, just keeping an eye on clock. Sometimes it's it's heartbreaking to be the moderator. Um, but this was actually something that came up during our last show. And I feel like we should make this a recurring thing because this seems like the perfect moment for it. Uh, somebody in the comments section had asked uh, for book recommendations. So with all of this in mind, um, let's, let's, let's go around the panel. Can you name up to three I'm just going to open it up to any sources, books, authors, Lee, you said blogs, podcasts um, of, of voices that tend not to get heard or that you think should be heard by more and more people. Um, and, and I'll write them all down. 
uh, if anybody wants to write them down as they're listening, but we'll have them in the show notes and the, the video description afterwards. So uh, can we start with uh, Lee? Is this too spur of the moment for you? you you've um, already thrown out a bunch. <laughs> Well, I will throw out based on our conversation around childhood sexuality earlier, sacred, not secret, uh, which is, I'm trying to remember the subtitle, it's like um, holistic something, sexuality, revolution, but it's got clever parentheses in it, um, by Christine LaPlante. So La Plant, but with an E then at the end, uh, combines understandings of chakra systems with Andersonian childhood theory in combination with then how do we raise our children with healthy sexuality? Excellent. Um, can't recommend it enough. Perfect. Um, Allison. Oh my God, I'm always so terrible at this, but I I'm, have two names in my head that I, I want to share. So, I mean, Andrea Marie Brown, a lot of people know about now, um, but I'm afraid I don't know their pronouns. Does anybody know what Andrea's pronoun or Adrian? Okay, anyway, um, I'm just gonna say they because I don't know. Um, they have a couple of books out. Pleasure Activism is a, is one that's really good because it just kind of explores again this sexual citizenship idea, this the way we have our have bodies basically, how to have a body in this world, right? Um, and then Sonia Renee Taylor is another example. She's a black poet who has a great book called The Body is Not an Apology. Um, and those are two really great authors to, to look at, you know, again, if you're interested in how, how sexuality and bodies work within a paradigm that is not white and that is not heterosexual, um, I think those two places, and they're also, again, very positive, very layman's kind of books, like anyone can read them. They're not academic. Um, and they're, I think they're really helpful for people to kind of, if you're, if you're watching this because you are kind of a neophyte or nervous, and this is a great way to have sexual or hear sexual conversations, those are two authors that are really great inroads to larger, more beautiful conversations around sexuality. Perfect. Andrea Murray Brown and Sonia Renee Taylor. I will get those into the video description as well. I figured uh, out my other two, if oh. that's okay. <laughs> Can you me All right, please. Um, please. Folks at Afrosexology, mm. um, their thing is um, less oppression, more orgasms is their tank top. Uh, <laughs> I think it's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, they are amazing. They've got online education stuff and are just beautiful beings. And then the other one is a, a spoken word artist performer named Lady Speech, who has a YouTube channel and other modes as well. And her channeled information slash academically, like it's all one shuffled beautiful thing is powerful stuff to download. Mm -hmm. And it's all free, but it's one of those, like, if you believe in supporting black disabled sex work, you know, black powerful sex workers, et cetera, like throw her money in Venmo. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Lady speech and Afro sexology. We'll put those in there too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Please, Camille. Um, so first of all, the things that came to mind that would be sex and sexuality ideas have already been spoken. Um, so I'm going to step away because um, I read a lot of fiction for fun. Um, and I um, have been making an effort, especially in inroads in like science fiction, to to recommend uh, writers of color, mostly women of color, because that's what I'm drawn to. Um, and so I did want to mention there is an amazing little book called um, "The Stars Change" by um, Mary Ann Mahanraj. Um, and it's a beautiful science fiction story and there's lots of sex in it. It's really good. Um, and then I just want to point out that like, because as we were saying with sexual citizenship, um, that everything in your life um, is part of that. And so I really want to recommend, everybody's heard of her, but Octavia Butler, um, she wrote an amazing uh, series of books called um, well, the, the trilogy is the Zeno, Xenogenesis, um, and it's about, uh, it's a science fiction collection, and I just can't recommend it enough with the way that it looks at how humans interact with another culture that has very different uh, sexual practices and, and different uh, existence. Um, and then, of course, because I am a rabidly political as well, I'm recommending everybody read Parable of the Sower uh, because it speaks to where America is right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's terrifying and sad and still 
really informative. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just, I want to plug that. Uh, Octavia Butler is one of my personal heroes and I'm sorely disappointed that she's not around writing more books anymore. Mm -hmm. But um, but yes, and so I, I think I mentioned Ed K N.K. Jeminson mm -hmm. um, at the top of the show. Um, and we already mentioned Nettie Okorafor, who I am just mm -hmm. madly, <laughs> madly yes. in love with everything that, that she mm -hmm. writes. Um, so yeah, I'm going to step away from um, books specifically about sexuality because they're already covered. <laughs> yeah. no, can, that's I, perfect. Can, I, can I add one little tip, also like a principle that I have when it comes to finding books? Um, I always like to, especially with sexuality, to encourage people, like I encourage myself, is to, if you're curious about something, try to find books written by people who live those lives. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that people can't write the other, right? Certainly there are great works that have been written by other, like people who do not have the experience. But like the American Dirt problem, like, if, like, if you're curious about transgender people, read books by transgender people. If you're curious about sex work, read books about sex work by sex workers. That is the, if you're curious about abortion, read books by, from people who've had abortions. It's just a, a better way to approach. It doesn't mean the quality will always be 100%, but it's a better way to approach what you're looking for is from people who've actually lived those lives and have those experiences. Absolutely. Um, like I said, sometimes it's heartbreaking to to moderate. It uh, it is time to move on, um, but I thank you all for the uh, for the recommendation suggestions. We're gonna we're gonna type these up and have them presented to everybody because I feel like my bookshelf is gonna grow a couple stacks, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, for the moment, um, just want to take a quick break to thank everybody again for tuning in. Uh, we still have more to come. Um, but also to remind everybody, let me pull up my notes here, um, to let everybody know that, uh, of course, the Mystery Box show is uh, is going to be having our big Valentine's Day show on on Valentine's Day. It's Sunday, February 14th. Tickets are on sale now at mysteryboxshow.com. Uh, we'll be having stories from Orpheus Black and Shanae Adams and Karan of uh, the Chronicle podcast and our good friend Aaliyah Liebenau, who's told many, many stories with us. Um, and and all the stories are so, we, we always try to get things a little bit more uh, sweet for Valentine's Day. And the stories are so surprising and, and wonderful. So we hope that uh, you all show up for that. Uh, again, tickets on sale at mysteryboxshow.com. And also you can support us uh, on Patreon if, 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 if you have a little bit to spare. Um, Patreon.com slash mysteryboxshow. We have several levels uh, that you can uh, throw a little money in our, in our jar every month to help keep the show going, especially in times like these, uh, the pandemic, the quarantine, uh, I'm sure you know that People who produce uh, art, especially theater art, uh, are struggling because there's no venues to go to. There's no uh, there's there's no in person things. And everybody who's been a patron of ours so far has been incredibly helpful in keeping the show going. We were able to launch our podcast uh, a couple of months ago, and that's been fantastic. Uh, all because of the support of people uh, joining us on Patreon and and donating to the show. Um, and if you want to follow us and find out more about where we are, uh, let me see what button is that. That is this button. Um, we're on Facebook, Instagram. Sign up for our newsletter where we uh, every week we'll tell you uh, what's going on with the show or just little sexual tidbits. Um, I'm, I'm guessing one of the next newsletters is going to have the list of, of book recommendations and article mm -hmm. recommendations from tonight's uh, conversation. And of course, the Mystery Box Show podcast. So you can get subscribed to that um, and get sexy stories in your ears automatically. Um, with that being said, um, it is time to move on to our final section of the show, which is uh, where we hear from all of you. Um, over the past week or so, we've uh, been receiving voicemails leading up to this show where people have had uh, sexual questions that they want to present to our panel, and we are going to present them now. So I'm going to bring the panel back. Uh, we have a couple voicemails. Let me see. Where should we start tonight with, uh, with some questions? Here we go. Question number one from somewhere out there. Hi, my name is Mike, and my question is, 
I've never seen a man have an orgasm and not ejaculate. Why is it that some women, when they have an orgasm, ejaculate or squirt, and others don't? How come they all don't? Because it seems that all men do. And uh, before we get to answering that, I just want to say on behalf of the Mystery Box show, uh, we might amend some of the vocabulary in that call uh, to uh, maybe not so much say men, but people with penises or people with vulvas instead of women, because those two terms don't always uh, Venn diagram themselves. Is that how Venn diagram <laughs> works? Um, but with that being said, I, th I think there's still a lot to unpack with that question. So uh, why is it that penis havers always ejaculate and not all vulva havers ejaculate with orgasm? Or is that a faulty premise? Panelists. It's a faulty yeah, premise. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll jump in at once. It's it's a faulty premise. Premise. But I personally have experience with penis havers that have orgasms without ejaculating. Uh, for whatever reason, sometimes deliberately and sometimes just how things go that time. Um, and that, you know, not all women squirt because, I mean, not all women even have orgasms as has been documented. So um, it's just a matter of different things and different activities causing different sensations for different people. Yeah, I mean, the word all is just the problem in sex in general. There's no such thing as all people doing anything. So that's just one thing right off the bat. Um, second thing off the bat, just to speak from a sex education perspective, the ejaculation on a vulva body versus ejaculation on a penis body are completely different biological mechanisms. And they come from completely different parts of the body. And so we could get into the anatomy all day, but basically, for, from sexual reproduction's perspective, ejaculation is what the penis owner does to help facilitate reproduction. Whereas squirting or ejaculation from a vulva bearer doesn't actually have a purpose in terms of sexual reproduction from a purely biological maintaining the line of species perspective. So they're, they're just different. Um, so most people, most penis owners will find themselves when they experiment with orgasm, when they have orgasms, they ejaculate naturally because that is what their bodies have evolved to do from a sexual reproduction perspective. Whereas for vulva owners, that's not something that our bodies have evolved to do. So some of us do naturally, some of us work really hard to learn how, some of us work, work really hard to learn how to not do it. Um, but basically everyone's body is different. And so these are just, you're just kind of ex approaching sexuality from a plumbing perspective. And you just have to understand that different parts have different biological functions outside of just sexual pleasure. And to add to that, also to be aware that how uh, orgasm is reached can cause different responses in the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Allison brought the idea that for vulva owners, there's there's not a reproductive purpose there. It's also the notion of what type of orgasm is happening, mm -hmm. right? Is this something that, um, for folks who don't know, the clitoris is a complex system, right? Mm -hmm. It's the clitoral shaft, and you usually see that, most people think it's just that little tiny, you know, nub at the end that's the clitoris. There's actually a whole structure. There's a shaft, there's, and two different sets of, there's bulbs and wings that come down underneath, that wrap around underneath the labia. Um, oh, Allison, do you have a model? I'm sure you have a model. Because I have, I have, okay, so I have a vulva, but I have a You're fantastic. So there you go. Right. So I love, I love it. So that's the actual full clitoral structure. And so if somebody is a vulva bearer, is it working on, right? Is it working with the bulb and doing that kind of stuff? Is it hitting the, the outside of clitoris, underside of the clitoris, or is it doing work where you're inside the, the vaginal cavity and going into um, what gets called the G spot, but that's in my opinion, slightly problematic because that names a part of the vulvic body off an old dead German dude. And like, <laughs> I have some feelings about that. <laughs> um, but like, where are we affecting that body is going to cause different physiological sensations and different body responses. So, I mean, and, and, and so like that whole, I, I think you summed it up well, and we could talk about physiology all day, but like, which I kind of want to. <laughs> a lot of We're nerds. We're nerds. <laughs> can, can, can I ask? So, 
I, I wonder if if this is too simplistic, but would it is there a corollary that is non-sexual in the body when when you say that all bodies are different, some of them respond differently than the others. Um, I know people who hiccup differently than others. You know, this, this, the sound is different. Some people sneeze like this, and some people <laughs> you can hear three blocks away. And that's just how their body works, how their lungs work or, or whatever. I, I wonder if that's a fair comparison or perhaps not, but it, it feels like anatomically we're all different. We just have different responses to different stimulus, sexual or not, no? Well, and even within a, with an individual person, like I personally, I sometimes squirt when I have an orgasm, depending on what's happening and what kind of stimulation I'm getting, and sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. It's not a question of whether it's a possibility or if it happens every time. It just matters what's going on and who's doing what and how I'm feeling and how things respond. It, it's not also a goal-oriented thing. Like, I don't go like, today I must squirt. Mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, you know, because I find that really intimidating and exhausting but <laughs> to have goal-oriented sex. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, so it's not even just the variance in different people. Even for a single person, mm -hmm. it can vary depending on so many factors. I mean, not just your physical <laughs> stimulation, but your mental state, your how you interact with the person that you're you're doing things with. All of that can affect how your body responds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's important just to simplify the answer. These are all amazing answers. I love. I'm I'm just taking all this up. Um, I think it's important to note, and I think Allison touched on this when she said like the purpose of the ejaculants are different, is to say like to assume that all ejaculation is to, to assume that the penis ejaculation and the, the vulva ejaculation is the same thing mm -hmm. is kind of saying like this person is sort of comparing the two saying, well, shouldn't it be the same because it's all the same, mm -hmm. um, but it's not the same to begin with. And I think mm -hmm. that's a simple <laughs> That's kind of the simple way that I see it is that they're two different things, even though we call them both ejaculation. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's that's a I, I love the deparallelizing of that also. Yeah. Um, let's go on to our next question, who I believe comes from Janelle in New Hampshire. Hello. So I have a question. Um, my name is Janelle and I am calling from New Hampshire. And recently, my husband and I were talking about how to restart our sex life together. Um, and one thing that he said that he would really like to incorporate is some dirty talk. And I have to say, I have, like, no confidence <laughs> when it comes to how to do this. I totally clam up. I can't think of anything that doesn't just sound like regurgitated stuff that you might hear in porn. It all sounds really disingenuous. So I'm just curious, like, how do you, where do you, like, start to get just, like, a natural script or dirty talk something to go off of? Because I know it's like I really want to show up for him this way but I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for words, literally. So any advice you could give would be awesome. Thanks. All right. Has anybody taken this journey from non-dirty talking to a mouthful of dirty words? <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want to say, um, actually, I have. Um, <laughs> not that I've ever been at a loss for words, but I think something that's really effective um, especially with new partners. And I know she's saying that this is with her husband, but I think this could be useful for anyone. But for me with new partners, for instance, um, I like to start out with, so doing things. So maybe she's with her husband doing the act that she already knows that he likes, or maybe trying something new and just asking, do you like this? Um, because that's sort of ask you're, you're getting information and it's, also can be perceived as sort of dirty talk, but it's like a place to start. And if your partner says yes or no, you could then say, uh, do you want more? So you, again, you're getting more, you're getting information, but it also sounds like dirty talk. And I think <laughs> that 
is less intimidating than like, hey, give it to me hard or like whatever it is. Or maybe that is an appropriate response. But that's my favorite uh, way to sort of dig in there um, as a start. Yeah, I think a lot of people have this idea that they have to suddenly like just erupt into sonnets of filth, right? And I think that <laughs> dirty talk, especially especially effective dirty talk in sex is often very simple, very like surprisingly simple for a lot of people. Um, it can just be like, like Reba, you're saying like a sexy question. Do you like that? Is there a word or a name that they like to be called, right? Let's say it's daddy. You can ejaculate daddy at all sorts of times, right? Um, <laughs> you can say it in certain ways in certain times. Um, and again, sorry is simple, like, you know, that feels so good, or you fuck me so good, or, you know, your cock is so hot, or whatever, really simple things that don't have to be very complex is a great way to just get used to it. So I think for some people, I'm one of those people who like the more turned on I get, the more pre-verbal I get, which is hard for many people to believe because I'm a very verbal person. But sex is one of those places where I just turn off my prefrontal cortex and my verbal skills disappear. But some of my partners find it really hot. So I, there are certain like touch tone phrases that I know, touch stone phrases that I know that some that my partners really enjoy. And so I'll know to just kind of throw one out there here and there, and that just keeps the vibe going. And it's a really simple way to get into the world of dirty talk. So I want to interject with the fact that I would love to have some mix of dirty talk. <laughs> Um, and also point out that that is a conversation to have, like, you know, what kind of words really work for you? What kind mm -hmm. of things, you know, turn you on? Do, are there terms that are really good for you? Are there terms that are very bad for you? Like I had a conversation with someone once where it was like, call me a slut, call me a whore, don't call me stupid. If you call me a stupid whore, we're done. Mm -hmm. But if you just call me a whore, I'm okay with that, you know? And so, you know, understanding what works for somebody and what doesn't. It doesn't even have to be, you know, necessarily um, words that you wouldn't use in polite conversation. If some people, you know, if somebody just wants you to say thank you 40,000 times while they're doing whatever they're doing, hey, you can do that. Mm -hmm. you know? And so actually having the conversation about what kinds of words and what kinds of talking help work for you, what what turns you on and what doesn't. Um, and And I just, you know. I think that's a good starting place as well, is just like talking about what kind of words work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Camille, that piece you brought up about, it doesn't have to be raunchy language, mm -hmm. right, to, to work. Um, practicing your tone of voice. For me, that was huge to realize that I could say thank you, or I could say, oh, thank you, <laughs> right? Like it's just a change of tone of voice. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the same words that are civil <laughs> in polite society become something debaucherous mm -hmm. with just fluctuation of tone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I will add um, Dan Savage, again, not everybody loves Dan Savage's advice. I think that one of the things that he talks about around dirty talk that's really useful is that again, it can be really simple where it, I think his formula is talk about what you're going to do to somebody, talk about what you're doing to them, and then talk about what you did just do to them. So it's like, I'm gonna fuck you so good. I'm fucking you so good. I just fucked you so good, right? <laughs> it's really a simple formula, but it does help. Again, like if you're at a loss for words, you're just describing what's going on, right? Like your cock is filling me up so nice. Like it's just a description of an experience. It doesn't require a lot of imagination. Um, those simple descriptions can be the thing that really sends somebody over the edge in the right way. I still want sonnets. <laughs> you deserve sonnets, Camille. I'm mean, gonna have to talk to my partners about that. <laughs> uh oh, Eric, you're muted. Eric, you're muted. I am muted. I didn't want to interrupt. Thank you. Um, I hope I hope that that was all helpful to uh, to Janelle. Um, I also wanted to add from from our experience of talking to other sex educators. You you've all talked about um talking about what kind of words you want to hear or what works for you and i think this is something that, that's counterintuitive uh to a lot of people including myself um but i've heard over and over from sex educators and coaches and everything that these conversations 
uh, asking about what you want, what words you want, or what you want to do, or what you like, any of those conversations, try to have those conversations as far away from the bedroom and sexual activity as possible. I know it sounds strange to, to be like asking over dinner, so what kind of words do you like in the bedroom? Um, but it's it's much more, um, what, what's, what's the word? It's, it's, it's much riskier in the moment to uh, to say now talk dirty to me and then suddenly somebody's like uh, 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 what do I do and then you freeze up and the moments ruined mm -hmm. so much better yeah. if somebody can go in with a plan and uh, mm -hmm. and expectations and boundaries mm -hmm. I think this might be a good time Eric to talk about a, a yes no maybe sheet and and negotiations and things like that that's always one of my favorite tools if you haven't heard of yes no maybes. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's, there are different kinds on the internet and we'll have a link in the description um, unless you've got one active right now, Eric, probably not. I don't um, right now, but I remember that Stella Harris uh, mentioned that Autostraddle has a, has a yeah, great actually, link. link to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's just, it's a list of options where you can sit down with your partner or partners or even by yourself just to like look at maybe options you had never even thought of before and do some self-assessment of Am I, would I be into this? Yes, may, no, or maybe. And so, and then you compare notes <laughs> and that's a really good opportunity for, for you know, the dirt talk uh, to elaborate on the things that you do and, and don't want, including, including dirty talks. But that's mm -hmm. one of my favorite tools to use. And the nice thing about those lists is you can always print them out in a month or two and see what's changed. I'm also- if you're comparing lists with someone else, if it's something that's unexpected to you or something that you're not into, um, it can be sometimes easy to be like, oh, why would you be into that? As compared to what about that turns you on? Mm -hmm. To come with curiosity if there's a miss, you know, a, a difference of desire rather than a repulsion of some sort. Mm -hmm. mm. I love that entering it with curiosity. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, we have one more phone call uh, uh, that, that we can do tonight. And I apologize to anybody whose uh, voicemails that we haven't gotten to. We're going to be having more sex people throughout the year. So uh, sign up for the newsletter, keep in tune to uh, mysteryboxshow.com. And we're going to do our very best to get to everybody's voicemail. If you've sent one in, we want to get them in front of our people, uh, in front of our sex people to have them answered. Uh, but our final, uh, our final call tonight uh, didn't have a name or a location but they do have a voice and it's <laughs> like this hey yeah thank you for taking my call a uh, little background i paid a sex worker four hundred dollars for a hand job it was nice but i felt reduced to a dick and some money and i wonder what it would be like to offer a friend four hundred dollars for a hand job because you know i'd rather give it to a friend than a stranger my questions are what is it about money that makes this messy and would there be a way of asking a friend without it coming off as creepy? And finally, is this, is this just a horrible idea never to be mixed with friendship? So thanks for considering my question. So well, I hear there's well, someone who wrote a book about that recently, about the idea of how friendship and sex can go together. <laughs> <laughs> Is, is, is okay. that what you heard? But was there money involved? That's the big, that's the bigger question. Yeah, is the money, it is the money the question. Money. And my question is, I, I feel like there are a lot of unanswered questions within those questions, such as, uh, you know, it sounds like this person is wanting a friends with benefits situation, but to pay them. And I wonder if the money is to establish very, very clear boundaries, the like mm -hmm. no strings attached whatsoever. This is transactional. But without that information, it's hard to say. So I think there are a lot of different potential answers. I'm really excited to hear what everyone has to say. Because <laughs> I think there are just there are so many nuances here. Yeah, please, anybody. Uh, anyone? anybody like to jump in? <laughs> I, I think um, my first thought after hearing those questions was, one, money doesn't have to make it messy, but we have a lot of emotional and, and ingrained and taught ideas about money and sexuality that probably are making part of that messy. 
for that particular person, but I don't think it's always necessary. Um, and the second thing I want to say is the second question about offering your friend $400 to give you a blowjob um, would greatly depend on your friendship. Mm. Because if you have a platonic friend that you don't know that well and you offer them money for sex, yeah, that's a never no go, not okay. That's just problematic and scary and can put your friend in a very, very intimidating. But if you have a friend where you're you're open sexually and you have conversations about those things and you're you're interested, it's possible whether money needs to exchange or not is a separate question, but you know. Um, it definitely, definitely needs to consider the context of your existing relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, you know, again, like Reba, I have more questions than answers, really, because I do feel like there's a lot missing from this call. Um, I think that, you know, I was surprised by this caller's kind of potential solution, because in my mind, I thought, oh, well, just ask for something different from a different sex worker, right? Like, you know, you might, when you said it felt you were reduced to a dick and money, well, then you might have asked for the wrong thing, right? You might have wanted more intimacy. You might have wanted more of a girlfriend experience or a boyfriend experience. You might have wanted something that the sex worker didn't know to give you. Um, so I think it can be that maybe this is a great sex work transaction and to keep it within sex work, but be more specific about your, what you're looking for. Do you want eyes, do you want kissing, you want to feel loved, you want to feel nurtured and given a hand job. These are, there are so many different ways to approach transactional sex than just like this side soulless and then friends are where you, where you get appreciation and love. That's not how it has to work. Um, so I think that my, my approach would be to maybe encourage this caller to try a little bit, being a bit, bit more specific and then also mining this caller's desires about what exactly did he or this person want that they didn't get um, and how can they try and be more specific about those asks. Yeah, I too was going to bring up the notion of GFE or BFE, girlfriend experience or boyfriend experience, if you're looking for that in searches, right? That's the the, the shorthand. Mm -hmm. um, because I I know a number of, like back when I was a sex worker, I did that sort of work. And like I had a gentleman who was a Lutheran minister that he what he was looking for was someone who could argue theology with him for two hours and then give him a blowjob. Ah. Like, I'm in. Let's go. <laughs> Seattle's best coffee. We're going to argue. It right right there. It's like, it was great. He was a fantastic reoccurring client. Like he was just wonderful, <laughs> but that's what he was looking for. And he had had a lot of false starts finding people because he, it was a similar kind of thing. He's like, I thought I was just looking for this, but it turns out he couldn't really get to the emotional point of it unless his brain was turned on. Mm -hmm. Right, he needed that intellectual eroticism of of the challenge of it. Right, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I I agree that it would look at that. And when it comes to friends and money, I think it depends on where your stories around money are. To examine your ones and your friends' ones before going into that space that a lot of folks in North America have. Camille, as you said, some, some trudginess around that, right? Like <laughs> there's some stuff there. So yeah, I'm fascinated by the question and I kind of just want to pick his brain and be like, and, and? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and to, to kind of piggyback off of that, Lee, like there's also so much sex work stigma in this in this culture that if you were to approach a friend and offer them money for sex, you might not only encounter challenges to your friendship, but they also might have, you might have them encounter a lot of their sex work phobia, and they might be insulted to be assumed to be a sex worker or to have assume that they would be willing to do sex work. And I'm not saying that that's a necessarily a healthy reaction, but it is a reaction that you might court. And so I think that that is maybe a, a reason why it would not necessarily be the best idea to approach with that because you might be challenging some really difficult stereotypes too. Unless your friend's a sex worker, in which case- Right, yeah, that's a good point. Like if you have, maybe try and find some more sex worker friends. <laughs> right, yeah. That was my thought too. We don't know where this caller was calling in from, but but maybe the this person has friends who are sex workers already and just doesn't know it. Mm -hmm. yeah. hopefully, hopefully this person is tuned in tonight and is uh, is is picking up some decent information. I mm -hmm. I know that it 
can be messy when when money gets involved. It, it makes me think. I always try to think of of corollaries again, like outside of sexuality. Like, if I were to offer my friend a hundred dollars to to bake me some of those cookies that I love every time they bake, is that messy, or is it the sex that makes it messy, or is it Allison? Like you brought up the sex worker stigma. Like, it, I can't imagine a friend saying like, "Do you think I'm a professional baker?" Like. You know, <laughs> There's there's oh, no bristling Jay. at that. <laughs> there's no bristling at that. The way that there's stigma with uh, with sex workers. So that almost feels like it brings us full circle around to uh, sexual citizenship mm -hmm. and uh, and empathy and awareness and just erasing those stigmas and taboos. I wonder what happens to the money question then. Word. Well, there's more than just sexual stigmas that are involved with the money question. We do live in an extremely capitalist society, mm -hmm. and that has a big effect on how people react to, think about, and feel about money. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I hadn't even considered that, that aspect of the question, mm -hmm. that money adds an entire power dynamic depending on your personal relationship and your friend's personal relationship mm -hmm. with money or access to it, right? If for you, $400 isn't a thing, and the other person is trying to make enough, you know, coin to pay rent, there is a profound power, potentially profound power imbalance there that's, you know, it is the, are you aware of your privilege mm -hmm. in those kinds of cases? Mm -hmm. Though I will say when we talk, you know, Reba brought the idea that it can also create, you know, firm lines. Uh, when I started my medical gender transition, so I had I was going under hormones, et cetera, my body was actively changing. I had a friend who was a sex worker and said, hey, what are your thoughts on me hiring you for an evening of a session? Because you know my body, you know me, you know my gender story, you know this path that I've been on. And I'm trying to find out what my body wants now, now that my body has been changing. What do you think? And she thought of it like she had to take a little time to think about it because we'd had this platonic, up to that point, platonic friendship. Mm -hmm. And we had to figure out what that was going to work, look like. And for us, it was, we're going to do this session and then consciously set a date sometime in the next two weeks to hang out in a way that was non-sexual to make sure we could, but it was rolling the dice in our case. We weren't sure, but we were both experiencing having intense and, com and complex sexual conversations. So do you have that skill set too? Mm -hmm. Do you have the ability to have those conversations? Right. And I wonder if this person has that friend in mind already because you mm. kind of have to read the room <laughs> before you <laughs> before you 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 ask that question so maybe that's a part of it god i i know this was anonymous but i really want to have this person on now <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good it's a really good question well, well and, anonymous person, if you're out there, you have the phone number, reach out to us or, or reach out to us through email. If that's something that you would be open to, it sounds like there's a, a lot to unpack. And I'm sorry, Allison, you were about to say no, something. I just want to say that it does bring it around quite nicely full circle to this idea of sexual citizenship, because one of the things that I always advocate for, and I know that like I am awash in lovely friends who I can talk to frankly about sex, people who I don't have sex with, people that I do, because I've constructed a life for myself where I can do that. And it took me a while because I didn't always have friends I could talk to frankly about sex and it made me sad and it made me feel isolated. And then I started actively cultivating a friendship group of people who I could talk to frankly about all sorts of things, shame, kink, assault, bad sex, good sex, all the things. And now I, me, like I feel like with you, Lee, like you have people in your life where you can be like, huh, this might be a good person to engage in this with because you already have a rapport where you can talk safely about these really challenging things around sexuality. And I think that I would encourage people to see in their life where they can shore up those relationships that they have and also cultivate new ones such that you don't feel like it's a weird, crazy thing. Sorry, not to crazy is a bad word there, but like it's a strange thing to, to have to reach across to try and find somebody that you can have a conversation with. Like we should all be so lucky as to have people we can ha be candid and be fully sexual people with friends, even if we're not actively having sex. I think that's a terrific place to uh, to wrap up the evening as we approach the top of the hour. This has been fascinating, and and just like I think when any of us get together, 
and, it, and it's proven true again tonight, we could keep going and going and going if only time and energy and internet bandwidth allowed. Um, but thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, everybody who's showed up and watching, please once again, uh, give it up virtually for uh, for Alison Moon, whose uh, who's books and work you can find at Girl Sex 101, brand new book, right off the shelf, <laughs> getting it. Um, Lee Harrington, who you can find at passionandsoul.com along with his Patreon and, uh, and, uh, and newsletter, was it, Lee? And upcoming um, events and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Camille, whose, uh, whose stories you can find right here on our YouTube channel. And Reba, whose Instagram has her incredible modeling. Um, so follow her and follow us all at, um, I'll pull up this one final thing. Uh, follow us all here on the Mystery Box Show's socials. Um, and thank you again to everybody who's shown up to engage with us tonight. Nicole, thank you for moderating uh, the, the the comments and keeping everything alive there. It's been great. Uh, we hope to see you all at our Valentine's Day show. Again, tickets on sale now at mysteryboxshow.com or support us on Patreon uh, if, if, if you head over there. Uh, lots of rewards to, to get into your inboxes there. This has been fantastic. Uh, Thank you again so much to everybody, uh, Reba, Lee, Allison, Camille, Nicole, everybody watching. Have a great night, and we'll see you next time on Sex People. <laughs>